continue to care for us. Lord, help us to show our love for you tonight by giving our tithes and sharing our offerings. Lord, I pray that you would uh, give those wisdom that make the decisions about the finances, Lord, and uh, bless our missionaries, Lord. Help them to know that we are continuing to care for them, Lord. Let them know we're thinking of them tonight and praying for them. Uh, please uh, bless this offering uh, and give it as well. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. That's one of the corrals from uh, West Coast Baptist College there at Lancaster Baptist Church. If you ever get the opportunity to, hello, Sister Tarina, good to see you. If you get, ever get the opportunity to, to visit Southern California, that's, uh, that's a must-see, is uh, stopping by and just, just bathing in the music at Lancaster Baptist Church and being around the excitement and realize that uh, not all that many years ago, that was just desert. And now there's sprung a spiritual oasis amazing uh, complex of buildings a true campus and uh, hello brother Preston and uh, just an exciting place to, to be around so uh, I'll tell you what for a Christian that would be more exciting than Disneyland you know when you go to Southern California or, or SeaWorld or anything else is to get to stop at some of these magnificent churches and then also take in you know the, all the other other stuff that Southern California has to offer but I uh, hope that'll be a, a high priority would you please take your Bible 
and turn to Judges chapter 6 and verse 11. Judges 6, 11. You know, it's amazing how many frightened men God has used in his work and for his glory. For example, Moses. Moses ran from Pharaoh, and then he encounters God at the burning bush, and he tried to evade God's call upon his life. He'd just as soon not have to, 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 to get involved. Would just li- had like to just go back and just take care of sheep, live a quiet life, have his wife and couple of kids, and just settle down and you know, run out the clock of life. But that's not what God had in mind. Or take the Apostle Peter, who ran away from Jesus when the Lord was arrested there after the, betra- the betrayal by Judas, and then denied the Lord when he was challenged about being one of Christ's disciples. One of the interesting things my wife and I saw in Jerusalem was they, they, have, they think they know the place where uh, the high priest's home was, and it's marked, of all things, by a rooster. They have, they have a statue of a rooster there, and that's to mark the place where the rooster crowed, and Peter denied the Lord. What a thing to be, I mean, praise God for all the great things, day of Pentecost, all the great things about Peter, but sadly, there's also that aspect of his life that, uh, that he, he, he turned chicken. <laughs> As the rooster was crowing, he was himself a chicken. And yet the Lord could use him mightily. There's John Mark, a young man who accompanied uh, Paul and Barnabas on one of their missionary journeys. But then he abandoned the ministry during one of those missionary journeys. Just got to be too much for this young man. And he he quit and went home. And the Apostle Paul was was so angered about this. Uh, You know, he and Barnabas more than willing to put up with the privations and perhaps others in their entourage as well. But this young man couldn't cut it, and he went back home to mommy. And, it, and it, when, when he wanted later to come back and rejoin the, the team, Paul said, no way. No, that guy's, I'm, I'm, you know, once burned, twice shy. I'm not taking him back with us. Barnabas said, but, but we've got to give him a second chance. Paul said, no. And, and, the, and the dissension became so sharp between them that they split ways and went, their, went, went separately. And that great missionary team was broken, though a new one formed with Paul and Silas. But John Mark abandoned the ministry. Later, the apostle Paul said, send John to me. He's 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 developed into a great preacher, and I can use him. And, And in his captivity, Paul learned to be dependent again upon John Mark. But for a while, he was marked down as a quitter. So you have Moses, didn't even want to get involved. Peter was a coward, and John was a quitter. Well, we now study another frightened man whom God wanted to use for his glory in Judges chapter 6, verse 11, where we're told, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the, the Abite Ezrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Those are bad guys whose raiders have come in and are playing havoc with the people and stealing their food at the harvest time. Verse 12, And the angels of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, <laughs> Or he said, oh, my Lord. Or did he say, oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? You've wondered that sometimes. Hey, if God's really with us, how could the car break down? If God's God's with us, how could the water heater blow up? If God's with us, you know, you, you, you wonder, Jenny must have wondered, Sister Virginia Salvadori, she fell and you know, she's she's kind of passed out and and uh brother denny said it was like the loudest thud he's ever heard a human body make he says it was a bang on the floor and when she came to she said my leg was one direction my foot was another <laughs> and it wasn't natural and it was all it was broken and she must have wondered man lord 
if, if we're on your side and you're on our side, how could this have befallen us? How can I possibly be fired or laid off? Or how can I possibly get notice? They're going to raise, raise my rent hugely or kick us out. Well, we all wonder about that sometimes in verse 13. Uh, careful about, about that, that 13. That's the number of rebellion. That can be the, the, the foundation of a rebellious spirit. O oh, my Lord, if thou be with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles? And I grew up hearing about these miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I, shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. Remember, Manasseh is half a tribe of Israel. So it's like, here I am in this little bitty group, a half tribe, and, and our family's poor in that half tribe. And I am the least man in this poor family in this half-tribe of Manasseh. Verse 16, the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. We learn in verses, as, we, as you go on, go on through the chapter, we learn in verses 17 through 21 that to bolster Gabriel's courage, the angel caused fire to emit from a rock to consume the offering that Gabriel had placed there for him. The angel then promptly disappeared. In verses 22 to 24, Gabriel was allowed the rare honor of actually hearing the voice of God. To continue building Gabriel's courage, the Lord instructs him in verses 25 to 33 to tear down the image of Baal that had a prominent place in his hometown. Gabriel did so, but he did it at night when no one was around to challenge him. In verses 34 and 35, <clears throat> the Midianites and Amalekites unite their forces to invade Israel. <clears throat> in verses 36 through 40, Jehovah gives Gabriel the signs he requested involving a fleece, a fleece of, of lamb's wool, where one night it's like, well, I'll tell you what, let me, let me set this thing out dry and let it be wet, and let me set it out wet and let it be dry. And, and on those, those two consecutive nights, the Lord did that for him to, 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 to encourage him, to, to bolster his courage. Then the narrative continues in chapter 7, verse 1, Judges 7, 1. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them, by the hill of Moreh, in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are what? Too many? There is a vast horde of Midianites. Too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there remained of the people twenty and two thousand. There remained ten thousand. There returned thirty, twenty and two thousand, remained ten thousand. The Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them. I will try them, or put them on trial. I will test them, as it were. I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, were three hundred men. 
But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. The Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. And let all the other people go every man unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and they sent all the rest of Israel, every man into his tent, and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down into the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. Immediately after that incident, Jehovah gave Gideon one more sign. He sneaked close to the enemy encampment with his servant, Fura. The two men overheard the remarkable dream. One enemy soldier told another, in which it seemed in this dream as if their vast army was doomed to suffer defeat at the hands of, and he named specifically, Gideon and his meager force. Who'd ever heard of Gideon before this? But somehow, God had got Gideon's name into the enemy army and attached to it fear of him as if he was a mighty warrior with a huge army. Now, that all happened, and immediately after, there came victory. Victory came right after, because, you know, this, this hearing, overhearing this dream so charged up Gideon, he did not hesitate to go back, organize his little group of men, and attack, and in attacking, they won the victory. God uses scared people to do some of his most noble, notable works. That yields more glory to God. There is glory, too, that goes to the courageous people whom God uses to create the victory. I mean, praise God for David who could face Goliath and win the victory. Courage is performance, though, that is taken not in the absence of fear. It's under. It's, it's undertaken despite the rational fear that is caused by a legitimate danger. There is no shame in fear. Only a fool is not afraid in a battle. And fools get themselves or somebody else killed. The only shame is to allow your fear to control you until you are perpetually immobilized and permanently disabled. There is much for a Christian to fear today. It's been said commonly for the past 25 years that the last group you can discriminate against or make fun of or show bigotry toward are whom? The Christians. Life has always been challenging for the, for the believer who will take the Bible literally and seriously. It has impacted your relationships and your earthly opportunities. But now, obeying God's word can cost you and your children your very freedom. Someone here may reasonably state, Pastor, I really am scared. I'm scared to spank my kids. I'm scared to identify homosexuality as a sin. I'm scared about witnessing for Jesus. I'm scared about door-to-door -door soul winning. I'm scared about street preaching. I'm scared about being sent to prison someday or getting beat up or getting killed for simply being a good Christian. What am I supposed to do? First of all, let me suggest, simply use all the liberties you have to the fullest. What we're allowed to do, let's do. And let's, let's, just, let's do what we're allowed to do for as long as we're allowed to do it. Attorney Matthew Staver, who's interestingly enough, been in the news quite a bit the last year, but he's the founder of Liberty Council. This is a law firm that represents and defends Christians and their liberties. And he wrote this, the founding fathers understood the importance of having sound governmental policies founded upon moral principles expressed through the Holy Scriptures. To remain truly free we must have the fires of liberty burn in our souls, and we must no longer, we must no longer be silent. The Bible declares, 
if thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? In other words, if you're in a peaceable place and wore out, what are you going to do when the river overflows and, and you've got to vacate? And, and all of a sudden, life isn't as easy as it was, once was. If you can't keep up with the footmen, how do you, how do you hope to, 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 under greater challenges, greater, greater trials, more severe problems, how do you expect to keep up? Second, find your strength in the Lord and do what you know is right in every situation you face in life. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, beloved, question for you. If the fear you possess and the, fear that I, the fears that I have, if they did not originate with God, whence came they? It's the devil. The devil is putting it in our hearts to be afraid of things that there's no need to be afraid of in many cases. Or even if there's something real there, we have a God who's greater than that. And so when we surrender to fear, that fear does not originate with the Lord. It came from another source. It came from Satan speaking in your brain. Also, the Bible says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Can I explain that to you briefly? I ask that like you're supposed to say, no! <laughs> I want to go home! <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Easy. Easy. <Don't>, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 I'm like you. I have wondered about this verse. I wonder about this, and like, I'll tell you, I, but I think I understand. They understand. You look at the little child's hand and the adult's hand. I think it's a perfect illustration of what I'm about to, what I'm about to share with you, and that's this. Um, you ladies know there have been circumstances where your child was endangered, and you forgot about everything. You, you, you charged in and you saved your child. I, for, for me, it, it's an incident that happened was I was very little. It was one of the earliest things I remember in life. I must have been about four. And my mom was in some kind of a shop. And uh, if you get, you get a picture, this is in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, right next to the Missouri River. So you got the shop, and there's this uh, parking lot that's at a, at a steep angle. So you had to kind of park up there and, you know, and, and then go into the store. And then there was a, a, a busy roadway. And then uh, there was, not far behind that, the steep embankment down to the Missouri River. So I, I'm this little kid sitting in the car, and uh, maybe it was my fault. I, I might have even bumped the emergency brake, but somehow the emergency brake failed. Now, it may have been me, squirming around, little kid, you know, and upset that mom's not there. She went in without me. I may have, been, I may have bumped the emergency brake, but whatever caused it to happen, the car started to roll backward. And some people in the shop spotted it and screamed, and my mom spun around, and she went racing out the door. Now, any rational person would say, bye, son. I'm still young. I'll have your baby brother I'll meet you in heaven later. Bye, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and just let me go. But instead, she flew down that embank down, down that steep driveway as the car is gaining speed. Somehow managed to open her driver door, jump in without being run over by her own car, and throw her foot on the brake. And we came to a screeching halt there before we could hit traffic. That was that was real heroism. My my mom's a heroine, not addict. Uh, my mom's a, a hero. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and she's coming to see me tomorrow night. I gotta make sure I, I remind her she's my she's my she saved my life literally, and so, but that's how moms are. Perfect love casteth out fear. So it's not saying well because I have the love of Christ, therefore I shouldn't be afraid. And if I'm afraid, I must not have Christ in me, the hope of glory. I must be like either unsaved or really really backslidden. Well, let me put it to you a different way. I, I would say it like this. I would say when you really, really are motivated to serve the Lord and your, your love level has reached a certain point, 
you, you'll throw yourself into situations that earlier life would shock you. I can't believe I'm, I'm saying this publicly. I, I, I can't believe I'm speaking up like this. I, I can't believe I'm actually, here I am actually witnessing for the Lord. I, I, I just, I can't believe it. I actually gave somebody a gospel tract. Man, this is great. And uh, it, it's, 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 it's the sort of thing that makes you, you know, it brings you out of yourself to the point where after the fact you're going, wow, was I like nuts? I mean, how many people in battle, when it's all said and done, think, you want me to be a hero? You, you want to give me a medal? Man, all I did was I saw a situation. I didn't want my buddy to get killed. I ran out there, grabbed him, pulled him back, and, and I'm glad I saved his life. But you know, it was just instinct. It was just I, I wanted to save my friend's life. I wasn't thinking about the danger. If I stopped and thought about it, I just waved goodbye. <laughs> you know, but but it, it's, it's the perfect love that casts out fear. Third, your love of Christ must cancel out the fear that is introduced to your heart by Satan. We have many wonderful examples we can follow, such as persecuted Christians who persevered in the Roman Empire, in Catholic-dominated countries, in the Soviet Union, in communist China, and in Islamic countries. Now, So, our brethren have done it, we can do it too. Gideon began with 32,000 troops. When God encouraged the frightened among them to go home, 22,000 took advantage of the invitation. They went back with only 10,000 left. But can I say, let's not throw stones at the 22,000. They were at least willing. Scared, but willing. And they went back. But at least they were they 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 started out. Then God put the ten thousand to a test. Nine thousand seven hundred of those men failed the test. But you got to commend them. At least they were on their way to battle. That's better than so many. Now, three hundred actually passed the test, and they actually went to war. Think about that test that God had Gideon put his army of 10,000 through. Remind me, what was that test? Yeah. So if you knelt down, what did that mean? (laughs) Should we say careless? (laughs) Not watchful? And so who was it that got to pass the test? So they could stay alert. They weren't going to be ambushed. They weren't going to be taken by surprise. They stayed alert. They were, New Testament word, circumspect. They were, they were watching all around for the enemy, just, just in case. And that's who God wanted. So what was the outstanding trait of the 300 who were allowed to remain with Gideon? Circumspect is a good word. Alert, great word. And, and I, would, I would use also the word, they were cautious. Being circumspect, being alert, they were cautious. They were aware of what was going on around them. They were careful. And beloved, you and you and I should be careful. There's a, there is a way to do it and a way not to do it. You've heard me mention several times, but it's just so appropriate here. It's just so, so perfect. One of our young men, while well, well still, uh, maybe still been a teenager, but he got a job at Starbucks. And he, he thought it'd be great to be able to, he, all these lost people coming through his line, who cares if they have the perfect latte? They're going to hell. So he took it upon himself to give a free gift to everybody going through the drive-thru. He gave him a gospel track. <laughs> well, needless to say, his job didn't last long, all right? So I, I realize that there's, and, and by the way, if the Lord tells you to do it, do it. At least he has a great story to tell. I mean, the, who knows how much longer the job would have lasted anyway? And at least now you can talk about how, and, and who knows which of those people may have actually gotten saved because he did something we see as being a little over the top, a little foolish. But in his foolishness, someone, we may meet someone in heaven that got saved because of that incident. Who knows? So, but, but I understand there's a time and a place. When you're, on the, when you're on the clock for your employer, then you've got to be mindful of that. And if you're witnessing, even answering someone's question, it's going to interfere with your work. 
You have to put it off to break or put it off to lunch or put it off to after work. And these days, you've got to be even more careful because, you know, the, the people are just so hypersensitive anymore about spiritual things. But, but we can't just completely be muzzled. So, so be careful. Now, these men were prudent. And you and I should be prudent. You know, there's, there's, you can tell someone they're going to hell without just simply putting their, your, their, your finger in their, in their face saying, you're going to burn in hell because of that rosary and that, that crucifix because, man, you're trusting the wrong thing. It's going to take you to hell. And I, I realize there's some who are saved with fear, and, uh, but you need Holy Spirit guidance. The default position should be love, <laughs> that you care, and, you, and, you're, and it, it, that care should come through as you talk to somebody. Uh, and maybe as a backup plan, you can get you know, much more serious about things. But even then, they should sense it's not that you're trying to win an argument or make them look stupid or prove them wrong. You're just simply, you're just that concerned that I think you need to know there's a consequence if you continue to reject Christ as your Savior. But be prudent. But don't be so careful that you are worthless for the cause of Christ. Get involved to the degree you can be. If at all possible, be one of Gideon's 300 who went with their leader into the heart of the action. If you can't be that courageous, be one of the 10,000 who goes with us as far as you can. If you can't be one of the 10,000, at least be one of the 32,000 who are willing to do what all you can to help. You're at least willing to be a help. And if you can't do that much, at least don't be a spiritual peace activist sitting at home criticizing those who go to war. Then encourage those who do, who are doing something for Christ, and don't sit back and, you know, why does, he, why does he get all the attention? Why does she always get mentioned? Why is that family always highlighted? Well, I don't know. And all I can say is criticizing them. Remember from Sunday, uh, we learn from Brother Chapel that the great enemy of striving together is what? Do you remember? Criticism. Just sitting back and being critical of those who are trying to do something for the Lord. And none of us will do it exactly right, but I'd like to at least give the benefit of the doubt that we're doing our best. We're giving it our best shot. And praise God for people that are doing something versus doing nothing. And, and you know, We've had this discussion in our home. Sometimes it's me taking the lead. Sometimes it's Tricia. Sometimes it's my wife. You know, if we get a little like, oh, oh, I can't believe so-and-so really blew that one or dropped that ball or forgot or failed us or whatever. And it's like, wait, wait, wait. Stop and remember all the ways that person has been a blessing to us and to our church. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. All right, cast out any ill thought and just remember they, they are a good fellow soldier. Now, remember that you and I serve a good and gracious God. Would you look back, please, at verse 7. That's chapter 7, verse 7. Ooh, double sevens. This is, this is really significant with God. The Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men that were lapped. Um, forgive me, not lapped. That were not, okay. I said that as if they're in a track meet, and, and, they, and they were so slow they got lapped. I didn't mean to say it that way. Lapping with, with, to get their water, like a, like a dog laps. Okay, let's say it again. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. And notice, let all the other people go. Every man into his place. Just let them go. You don't have to s criticize them, boo them, throw stones at them. Ridicule them. No need for any of that. Just let them go. You know, uh, I, I try to find a balance when, when people backslide or people leave the church. And, so, you know, uh, there, there, there's a part of me that, that says just let them go. And, and I try to judge the situation, okay, to what degree do I get involved? To what degree do I encourage them back? And I, and, and I realize there's got to be some effort made. But in some cases, we've said all there is to say. 
My, my wife has been helpful to me on, on this because she knows. I will mention names of people who left us years and years ago. And I still hurt that they're not here with us. And, and I'll say, you know, boy, I've, I've, I've thought about calling so-and-so or, you know, I, or I sent something to this person, never left a voicemail or, or, or I sent them something, didn't hear anything back. And, and she'll, she'll say, in effect, hon, you got to let it go. You've got to let it, let it go. They w- if they wanted to be here, they'd be here. They don't want to be here. And I, I shared a, a verse, a, a morning verses. For, for a few years, I just sent verses out by text, and now I'm ex- I've expanded that into more commentary, more of a, more, more of a uh, devotional. But, uh, man, one lady, she got hold. I sent to a bunch of people, I don't know, 30 or 40 people, a verse. And it, it's from 1 John, and it talks about how uh, if, if th- it says, in essence, they're not one of us because they're not of the same heart as we are. If they were of the same heart, they'd be here. Well, she's one of dozens to get this, and she chose that verse to, to say, are you, are you trying to say something about me? Are you, are, you, are you trying to say something derogatory about me? <laughs> no. And she pretty well, you know, at that stage, kind of cut off communication, and that w- which greatly uh, vexed me. But there, there does come that point, that point where we got to just let them go. God was saying, in effect, if they're convinced they can't do it, they can't do it. Even Almighty God, you know, remember there is a city in the, in the Galilee region where the Lord said, I can't do any more miracles here. They just don't want me. That's it. I'm, I can't do any more works here. I'm done. If they're convinced they can't do it, they can't do it. If you're convinced you can't do it, you know, but Christ strengthening me, and yet I still can't do it. The Lord's going to say, okay, then I guess you're right. We can't do it. I've got to have a willing vessel. I've got to have some faith involved. And the Lord said, in effect, just let them go. I will get the job done with the handful of troops that remain, and you and I will both get more glory from the victory that I will bring to pass. So I realize at times you're thinking, Man, where is everybody? Hey, if you and me are here, praise the Lord. That's good. So you come to a prayer meeting, just a handful of people. Hey, you, you're obedient. I'm obedient. We're here. Praise the Lord. Handful of people come out on Thursday night or a handful of people come out Saturday morning to, to go to Nordock King. Hey, you're here to give glory to the Lord and let God do something with this handful. And uh, those that are willing... He'll, he'll do something, and those that aren't, want, that, that aren't, they just miss out. Now, to the, to, the, <laughs> to the degree I can, I'd like to be your Gideon, to lead you to do things you would not otherwise do on your own. Just, just, it would not come spontaneously. It needs, you need some kind of instigator, some kind of, someone that will push you a little bit and get you to do things you wouldn't otherwise do. Now, my main qualification for being your Gideon is that, like Gideon, God put, me in the, God put me in this position of being your pastor. I didn't put out resumes and make phone calls and say, you know how many places that needs a pastor? Believe me, if I had searched for one, I would not have chosen the church meeting in the beat-up little building in Petaluma. That would have... That, if I had... <laughs> If I had any sense at all, I would have stayed in a comfy position in, in San Diego in a big church with, with you know, secure and not, never have to worry about finances. Just, you know, it's all, it's all taken care of. I just do my thing. But uh, it, it, that is not what I would, I would have looked for buildings. I'd look, I'd have been, like so many guys today do, I'd be talking about, well, you know, like what's the salary, what's the retirement program, what's, what's your vacation, what do you provide for a man's vacation? And we, we talk about those kind of things. So it, I didn't seek it, but I did feel it's what God wanted for me. And I have to admit, like Gideon, I see myself as a poor candidate for the position. Two things about a leader is interesting. So many of them are loners, yet called to work with many people. And very few 
think that they're up to the job. That's one of the things that feeds into such a high turnover in the, in the pastoral position. The average pastor today lasts in his church about two to three years. And by that stage, he's preached everything he knows. And the people now, all, they, you know, the honeymoon is over. And he knows all their problems, and they know all his and his family's problems. And he just figures it would be easier just to go somewhere else. Just, just to cut my losses and just move on. So I realize that, that, that I'm not an ideal pastor or man for the job. But I have to say, that does put me on par with Moses. I'm not claiming to be a Moses. I'm not claiming to be a Gideon. But it puts me on par with a Moses whom God used so mightily, even though he had such misgivings about his own capabilities. Beloved, here's what I want us to do. In, in the spirit of Gideon and his 300, let's raise our families for the Lord by Bible principles. Let's go out and get a bunch of people saved. Let's bring those people who are willing into the church, even if that turns out just to be a small minority of the greater whole of, of people who at least get saved. Praise God somebody's getting saved. And I realize only a small proportion actually come into church, but praise God for them. And of those that come to church, let's get some of them baptized. And of those that get baptized, let's see some of them join the church. And of those that join the church, Let's train some of those to be soul winners and workers in the ministry. And let's promote some of those into leadership in the church. The net result may be a relative handful of excited, mature, productive Christians, but God can still do great things with small things like you and me. Anybody remember Vacation Bible School? <laughs> Truly, I, I, mean, I realize there's a good proportion of our church got involved, but the actual nuts and bolts of it was a handful of people that made it happen. And, and so it is in, in so much of what we do. Great things are accomplished by a few who just say, it's, I just got to get this done. This is for the Lord. A gentleman by the name of, and I hope I pronounce his name halfway correctly, Ergun Mehet, uh, Mehmet Kaner. Air gun, not air gun, but air gun, may met Kaner, who was saved out of Islam, wrote these words. He says, I'm not sure where I came across the martyr's oath. Such oaths are common in the hands of my people, where Christians face death on a regular basis. In the past few years, versions of it have appeared in Persian and Arabic countries usually scrawled in hurried handwriting. It is, not un, it is not uncommon to hear of Christians even incorporating it into their wedding vows as they begin their lives together as evangelists and church planters in lands where conversions declaring Jesus as Lord are capital offenses. Can you imagine? Do you take this woman to be your wife and to someday die in, for Christ together? Oh, I do. Can't wait. That's in essence what they're saying. So here is this version of the martyr's oath as given to us by Brother Kaner. He says, Today I stand as a dead man. I declare that in Jesus Christ I am saved by his blood, and thus I am dead to sin, and no longer dead in my sin. Today I stand and declare that I surrender my will and my life to his will and his life. I shall go where he sends me without asking questions. I shall go, I shall go uh, wherever he sends me without seeking fame. I shall preach, I'm sorry, I think I, think I understand now where I made the boo-boo here. I shall go to whomever he sends me without seeking fame. I shall preach to everyone, even if they hate me. I am an ambassador of the cross and must deliver the message. I shall pour out my life to reach my family, my friends, my neighbors, and my city. I shall embrace the shame of the cross, and I fearing nothing but God. I welcome suffering 
shame, persecution, beatings, imprisonment, and death. But I will not be silenced. If I am killed, I pray that my blood should be a harvest for souls. This is my city. I dare not do less. Lord, I thank you for what you taught us tonight. And I pray such a resolve will grip our souls. And when that's finally all said and done, may we be counted amongst what is tra traditionally considered to be the 20% of the church, of any church, that actually gets involved in the work of the ministry. I pray, God, that is where we'll be comfortable. That's where we want to be in the heart of the action. We want to be in the heat of battle. And I pray, God, that you'll help us to consistently seek out opportunities to serve you and when they are announced, when they're presented to us, may we go for those opportunities, be involved. And then, Lord, help us to be over and above that, your agents individually, going places where the rest of the church will not go, and being your representative, your ambassador, to everyone that we meet. God, I pray that we'll realize we are Christians full-time, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. May we behave ourselves accordingly and always look for the opportunity to share the gospel and win souls to Christ. I thank you for this, Lord, and may we ourselves embrace the principles behind the martyr's oath and be willing to pay the ultimate price for you if that time comes. Well, thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, let's take our hymnals before we go to prayer, and we'll turn to number 386. 386. Uh, Trish, you have it circled here on my sheet. Is there a special arrangement for this? Or? No, no, we didn't circle. We didn't have the color on it, so you just follow it. Thank you very much. Let's stand together, please. She knows my system. She said, Dad, it's not colored. <laughs> now, you're not, you, you'll forget. So thank you for the reminder. Let's all stand 360, 386, with or without. Got it? Let's do it. Praise Him, praise Him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Praise Him, praise Him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Love Him, love Him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Stay and pray with us. Seek, uh, let, let me know so I can put together the partner.